Our next speaker is Juan Facorro. He will, he's a polyglot programmer currently working in Erlang, as you can see on his notebook. And he talks about the challenges he faced while implementing Clojure on another uh, yeah. virtual machine. Yeah. So cool. give him that warm applause for Juan. Thank you. Uh, I am very excited to be here. It's partly because I think it's my first uh, closure conference as a speaker, my first time in Berlin, and uh, probably because I had six or five coffees today. So I, I think it's a combination of all these factors. And uh, today I'm going to share how one would go about implementing closure on a new host based on the experience that I've had. Uh, through the process of implementing closure on the, the Erlang VM. So the first thing that you have in any project is uh, an idea. And as part of the idea, you first start to think who's done it before, if anyone has thought about this, and if they had and they have tried it, then why did they abandon it or how far did they get? And uh, But ultimately, what you want is to be excited about the idea. And if you think that it's a good idea, then I have this inspirational quote by Richard Feynman. Uh, that there is no authority or who decides what is a good idea. And uh, he had a bunch of good ideas, so I think it's a pretty good uh, authority on deciding what <laughs> that. And uh, so you decide that you want to do this, and then there comes a little bit of hammock time that is, is pretty good to have. So one of the things that I end up doing is listing all the closure features that I could find in the closure.org page and deciding which ones were easy or were low-hanging fruit to map into the VM or the host that I was targeting. For example, data types are generally something that you can easily map. There might be some of them that are missing, but it's still like integers are integers almost anywhere. And uh, you can also start investigating how other implementations are built and what trade-offs they have made, especially Clojure proper, like JVM, or Clojure Script, which is a, a pretty good source of trade-offs or things that have been left out of the canonical Clojure implementation. So bridges of hammock time are necessary, obviously, all throughout the project, because you have to stop and think about stuff, even though sometimes you just want to start coding and get something working. And it's also uh, useful to uh, sometimes to think a little bit and then have, have, do some work, explore some ideas, discard them, and such. So as part of the hammock time, uh, I came up with uh, a diagram that shows I, so I didn't have a clear idea when I started uh, of what actually would be a complete or what would be considered a complete imp implementation of closure or an implementation that would be considered closure. So I started thinking about what exactly is closure. And uh, I came up with this diagram post fact. And uh, the first thing that I at least think about when I think about closure is its data structures and data types. So these are all the things that we manipulate all the time and they are the base upon which Clojure is uh, built. And uh, on top of that, so once we have our beloved data structures, then Clojure provides all these special forms that are the elements with which we construct code. And interrupt is just, for example, the dot special form is just a way of interrupting, so communicating with the host language. And on top of that, or besides that, but I wanted to do it in one dimension, it's, uh, there are functions, which are the, the most fundamental uh, elements in a functional language, of course, and macros, but they are just functions that get evaluated at compile time. But once we have all these elements, all these layers, then on top of that, we can start building Clojure Core, which kind of bootstraps language. It has all the functions that we use all the time. 
And with Closure Core, we can finally get all our core libraries, and on top of that, all the libraries that we build and use all the time. And there's something very important that goes throughout all these layers, that is the namespaces and bars, that is how we think about Closure. So this, we need to define exactly what those mean in our host language. For example, in, in ClojureScript, namespaces and bars are not reified. And uh, in the Clojure JVM, namespaces are just an object that live in memory, and bars have their own classes, and there are also instances of uh, classes. So the part that is the compiler, or the part, the part that we start building, or we should, is uh, those three layers that I Mark there. So let's see what the compiler is in, in a nutshell. So very, very high level. The compiler is uh, these three components basically that it gets fed a closure file and then it uh, one top level forum at a time. It reads the file as a string. Out comes closure data. Then the analyzer figures out what this closure data means. It generates an abstract syntax tree, which has a lot more information about uh, what this data, data means. And after that, the emitter figures out how to represent this, represent this in our host uh, platform. So as an example, we can see how uh, the string foo for a keyword gets processed. It, it feeds into the reader. Out comes closure data, which is just a keyword, an instance of a keyword. After that, the analyzer figures out, oh, this is a constant. So let's, uh, let's return the representation as an abstract syntax tree of this constant, and then all the annotated data around this. And finally, the emitter figures out what to do with this abstract syntax tree. It depends on the host, obviously. And for example, for a keyword, the closure JVM just creates an instance of keyword using the, the function of the, of the keyword class. Closure script does something similar. And in the case of uh, what I did, there is a native type in the Erlang VM that just represents the value that it uh, has assigned. So they, it maps really well to keywords. It's called an atom in the Erlang VM, but it doesn't matter. So we have a kind of an idea of how the compiler works, and uh, we've thought about some stuff, but we want to get going. We want to start building something. And uh, let's say that we want to compile this simple namespace. What is the first thing that we need to do? We need to convert this string into a data structure, and that's the job of the reader. So when you start, when you sit down and, and say, okay, what does a reader do? It converts things, strings into data structures, but then you need to decide how to represent vectors and maps and lists in your host language, because it might not have them. In, uh, in ClojureScript, there was uh, an implementation uh, of all the data structures of Clojure in ClojureScript, which was, it's called Mori, and that's what ClojureScript, I think, to this day uses. If someone, uh, I think that's, that's pretty much what it uses. And uh, the Clojure JVM, part of the, the most, most of the research work that was done when Rich Kiki created Clojure was done on the data structures. So it's a big part and you should think about a lot. In my case, for the Erlang BM, there are already immutable data structures. So the mapping is not one-to-one, -one, but I reuse those. And uh, data structures are mo in Clojure are implemented in terms of protocols or interfaces. So Clojure JVM uses protocols Sorry, it uses interfaces for data structures, and ClojureScript uses protocols for everything, which is kind of nice because all the language is very consistent in that sense. So when you, when you implement the reader in your new host, you have to manipulate data structures, Clojure data structures, and you need to figure out a way to implement. It, it can be a very naive uh, implementation of protocols, but since you want a uh, a unified way of manipulating the data structures, you need to figure out uh, a way for protocols to work. It doesn't have to be efficient at first, you can iterate on the idea, but that's, uh, that's a very necessary uh, work that you need to do. And 
as you as you might already know, there's these classes in Clojure JVM that allow you to manipulate these data structures when you don't when you don't yet have Clojure Core because you haven't built it yet. So these uh, functions in Clojure JVM, for example, rely on the fact that your data structures implement the interfaces. But if you don't have interfaces or protocols, then you start handling cases very spe specifically, and you don't want that. So the reader has a bunch of implementations. The tools reader implementation is very readable, and I mostly base my implementation on that one. And uh, if I had any doubts, I went to the Lisp reader, which is a JVM implementation. So namespaces and bars is something that we saw that is the way that we think about Clojure Core at a high level. And as I mentioned before, ClojureScript doesn't reify either namespaces or bars. They are available at compile time. And uh, you can do the same. In fact, I tried to do the same. But if you want to have a self-hosted language, then you need to keep track of, uh, of the current namespace. And you need to keep track of all these runtime things if you want to evaluate forms at runtime. And uh, so if you are fine, like ClojureScript, not self-hosted ClojureScript, but the original, uh, in, with not uh, having eval, for example, then you can just keep uh, your namespaces not reified at runtime. Otherwise, you need to do the work on how to map your namespace into your compilation unit and re represent it uh, at runtime. Another thing that you need to figure out regarding namespaces and bars is this, uh, this mapping between your, what does the namespace, how is the namespace represented in your host language? For example, in Erlang, you have modules, and modules are just a collection of functions, so it was kind of straightforward to map this. Uh, and bars need to be mapped. A var is generally just a function, but in some few cases, it's just, it's, it has an actual value. And uh, that's what def do. It just creates a var. So does it create its own compilation unit? Does it create? It ha does it have its own module, or is just is it just a function on a module? For example, in JavaScript, functions are just JavaScript. In ClojureScript, uh, Java JavaScript functions are Java uh, Clojure functions, which is very nicely mapping. A uh, very nice mapping. And we segue into functions, which is something, it's central to functional languages, obviously. They can be passed around, they can be bound to symbols or stored in bars, and this just means that they are first class citizens. And if your host, lang if your host platform doesn't support or doesn't have functions, then you need to figure out how to emulate them, like uh, Clojure JVM does. It just creates instances that implement this interface. JavaScript has functions, as you know, and the Erlang VM is since a functional, it was a, a VM designed for functional language. It has functions as first class uh, citizens. The thing is that functions have metadata, so you have to be able to attach uh, arbitrary values to it. And that's not trivial if your host language doesn't have. Do you wrap it around and then you attach values, or do you just represent them as, as they are. If you wrap them around, then you lose interoperability. So these are trade-offs, that non-trivial trade-offs that you do have to make. Also, variadic arity is something that is uh, a little tricky, depending on your host. Uh, variadic arity can be uh, something, as example, you can just emulate them by having a, a, the last argument of your function have being a list, and then figuring out at compile time how many arguments do you have. Otherwise, you have to configure it out this at runtime, and that's uh, costly. But then you you are supporting variadic arity. And once you figure all these things out, which kind of takes some time because you have to try a lot of things out, and you are kind of ready to go on to the other uh, components of the compiler. I mean, you can do this uh, alternate, uh, alternating between one thing and the other, but it's, it's a nice thing to be thinking about this all the time because you have to solve it. These are problems that need to be solved in order to have a working implementation. And the analyzer, it just takes a, uh, as I said before, it takes a closure data structure, excuse me, 
and then like, tries to figure out what does it mean. For example, if it's a list, uh, what, what does this list mean? And the top level logic that you have in the analyzer is basically this. If it's a seek, then you analyze that seek. And the seek can be a call, uh, to it can be an empty list, and then that's just a literal empty list. But if it's something that has a symbol as its first argument, then it tries to figure out what the symbol is. If it's a special form, then you parse that special form. If it's a function invocation, you try to resolve the symbol. And if it's a macro expansion, then it tries to macro expand it. And after that, you have all the other cases of, da of different closure data types, and you just figure out what do they mean. When you expand macros, a macro can call any of the other functions that you previously have in that namespace. So that means that any function that you declare before needs to be available when you define the macro. And this can be tricky or not. For example, ClojureScript doesn't emit, ClojureScript emits JavaScript code in strings. So the way that you can only have a macro in ClojureScript is if it's defined in Clojure because of this, these other functions that get compiled in ClojureScript, they are not available at, run, at, at compile time. And having this emitted, or we have not talked about the emitter yet, but have this available means that you have to create these functions as you go along. And if your compilation unit is a collection of functions, then you have to recompile this compilation unit all the time, adding things at the bottom. This can be costly. So you have to find clever ways of going around this, if that's the case in your host. There are reference implementations, again, for the analyzer. So the analyzer, apart from this uh, macro, well, at least I didn't find any other really challenging thing about the analyzer, because these implementations are very good. And you can always go to the compiler.java uh, implementation in the Clojure JVM, which is very nice. Uh, it's kind of hard to follow, but it's uh, what Clojure actually is. So you can always get a good reference from there. And uh, finally, the emitter is just a way of translating this into what you've already th thought about. So how do you how do you compile a constant into your host language? How do you map uh, your closure collections? What does it mean to have a literal vector, for example? How do you, uh, it might be a call to a function or, or whatever you've decided. And special forms are the, the elements which we build closure, but in the host, in the host uh, platform, they can be either equivalent or something completely different. For example, def is something that will create a representation of a var for you if you've decided to have that uh, available at runtime. And there are also some host-specific special forms that you might have. For example, the RLMBM has message passing, so you have to have, there's a, there's a native or a special form in Erlang called receive, which is a blocking kind of command where you wait for a message to come. And that's, there is no way that you can have that if you don't have a special form. So you might add special forms based on your host. So we've done all this work. We've gone through the special forms. We've implemented them. You don't have to implement them all at once. You can implement one in the analyzer, implement the emission of that form, and iterate through that. And you can add tests, little files, that with which you verify that what you are, you're building actually works. I will talk a little bit about testing later as well. So let's say that we can, we are at the point where we figure all the things that need to be figured out to compile this, and we've finally done it. We have a module that's being compiled, and that feels quite good. But then you realize that there's a bunch of work missing because there's closure core. And Clojure Core has all the things that you actually want, right? You want all the macros, you want all the functions, you want all the things that really matter. The thing with Clojure Core is that it's 7,800 lines of code. And uh, when you first see it, I mean, when you first check it out, it's daunting. And, uh, but you don't have to compile them all at the same time. You can just comment out most of it and uh, add one by one and figure out what you need to do as you go along. So I think this is part of the implementation that took me the longest because there is a lot of things there and there's a lot of uh, good stuff that 
you need to figure out. For example, so the structuring is, just, is actually just a macro function call, but then you're really testing macros there. Then printing is something that relies on dynamic binding of bars. So you're really testing dynamic bi binding there. If you, if you screwed up somehow, then you will find it. IO is uh, built upon a lot of abstractions in Clojure. So you will, you will need to implement the, either in your protocols, you, you can implement the, the IO uh, behaviors. Uh, and you need this to have a REPL because the Clojure main uses, does heavy use of uh, IO things. Then there's transducers, reducers, and chunk sex six, which is something that you might not have uh, thought about when you went through the data structure thought, because it, it slipped my mind. For example, I found it in the in Closure Core. And but at some point, you will be able to include all the core libraries that Closure includes, and find even more problems. But uh, that's fine because you will build uh, incrementally the the. the all of the all of the libraries, and at some point also you will be able to compile closure tests, which means that you will be able to include all the tests that are written in closure for your project. You might want you might have to tweak them because not I mean closure tests are written for the closure JVM, but if you adapt them, most of them apply to your to closure in general. And uh, Talking about testing, so the reader is actually very easy to test because it just is a transformation between strings and closure data structures. The analyzer is also just a transformation between closure data structures and some representation, which is a map. Uh, and the only tricky thing to test is the emitter, which you have a, an AST, and then you are, you are uh, either creating some intermediate representation for, you, for the compiler of the host to compile. Then if you want to check that, I ended up replicating the logic that built this intermediate representation. So the workaround that I found is that you just create these little compi compilation files. So these little closure files that use the special forms that you're compiling, and then verify in there that what you're compiling is correct. If you once you have the throw special form, then you can use that to to compile or your or your this little example files. And if something doesn't work the way you expect, you throw something, and your test fails. Uh, host interop is something. So this is a situation that you don't want to be in. Uh, when you think about host interop, if you are hosting, if you are targeting a specific host platform, host interop is something that you need to be that you need to be aware all the time, since what you want is some seamless uh, communication with your host uh, VM or platform. And uh, this is a big part of the, of the characteristics of, of Clojure, that it's a hosted language. Uh, you want to design for the minimum amount of friction. And uh, for example, the airline VM has uh, some things that are not available in, the, in other platforms that Closure has implemented it, for example, pattern matching and bitstring manipulation, uh, message passing special forms. And something that I went through a bunch of iterations is uh, function calls for, for Erlang, because Erlang, in Erlang you can just call some function that doesn't even exist. This is not checked at compile time, but Closure does check this at compile time. So I devised some special uh, syntax for closure functions first, and then that was very awkward because I, I realized when I had to start calling Erlang functions. And then finally, I just add a warning if at compile time I can't find an Erlang function that's uh, being called from a closure file. This is a list of features that I considered. That, so the green ones, this, this list of features is a list of features from closure.org. The green ones are the ones that I considered complete. You might check and disagree, but this is my opinion. And then the light green ones are the ones that I had to, or I decided to make some non-trivial trade-offs. The red one is the one that reducers. It's in the bottom. Some of you might not see it. But it's, some, it's a one that I haven't had time to, to do yet. 
And uh, transients, it's uh, something that I probably won't, will never do, because there is no mutation in the airline VM, and transients rely heavily on mutation. So I would have to implement, re-implement all the closure data structures to have transients in C, which I have no desire to do. So if you have any questions now, I can. Cool. You left uh, some speechless. <laughs> <laughs> why did you do this? I, <laughs> that's a good question. So I, I, there's a talk, uh, there's a lightning talk uh, at the end of today. And, uh, but I can give you, I was very excited about Clojure for a long time, and the airline VM is a very powerful VM. And uh, combining the two seemed uh, like a good idea. And since there is no authority on what a good idea is, <laughs> I just did it. Uh, thanks for the, talk, uh, the presentation, very good. Uh, one question, is it possible, um, like today, to mix uh, Erlang, Elixir, and Clojure code in the same project? So the answer is yes. You would have to do some, some of this mixing on your own. Uh, since, so everything compiles down to Erlang, and uh, you can call Elixir, function, Elixir code compiles down to Erlang, and so does uh, Clojure. So if you have the compiled beam files, which is the extension for, for closure files, uh, for Erlang files, then, and if you load them into the virtual machine, then you can call them seamlessly. So you have to have, Elixir has a runtime as well, you have to have the closure runtime. So closure is just a library, just like closure. <laughs> yes, so any other questions? Maybe one last question before the wrap up. Uh, so, do you have a self-hosted compiler, and uh, if not, did you use something like Tools Analyzer or something else, or implemented everything by yourself? I I, I wanted a self-hosted implementation, so mm -hmm. I did implement re-implement everything in Erlang. But I I mean the the implementations are heavily based on Tools Analyzer and Tools Reader, and the closure implementation, and I also picked a little bit on the closure script analyzer and reader, and I also took some ideas from Elixir, which has macros. So it's like a mixture of all the, all of these. So some hindsight. So whenever I wasn't sure of an implementation or decision, I tried to force myself to think about a couple of options because uh, it was easier to be sure about the decisions that I made later. I mean, generally I wanted three options, but I only ended up with two, and uh, I just chose the one that I was co more convinced. And language programming is lots of fun. Uh, it's, it's a lot of time as well, but it's a lot of fun. And I've, I don't know if you've seen the 10 years of closure talk by Rich Hickey, but he mentions that he was at a, at a at a meetup, like a language implementation meetup, when before he even started Clojure or when he had started it, and there was programming language programming people talking about that they hadn't used a database. They couldn't remember the last time they could they had uh, used a database. So Rich Hickey says, if people that don't use a database can write programming languages, then anyone can. So this is part of the reason why I would I wanted to give this talk because it seems uh, like very hard, but it just requires time and uh, and the will to do it and you also have to enjoy it otherwise it's just torture right and another thing that I think that I would have liked to do is share the code earlier because I would have uh, had more people involved that, that were interested and uh, writing tests was very good because I could change I mean, all the things that I talked about testing, it, it, it allowed me to, to change a lot of things, a lot of implementation details with high confidence that I wasn't breaking anything. I mean, I still found bugs. Uh, for example, the Erlang, the representation that I use for the Erlang code, the, inter the intermediate representation, it doesn't, comp that doesn't evaluate arguments in order in, for function calls. 
And that was really hard to figure out that that was happening. I mean, it wasn't the specification, but it was hard. Um, and then I have nothing else. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you. I even got the